the book, the, the, the book uh, that I did with Sandy Moffat is actually called Arts of Resistance, as you said, but that's out already. What we're actually working on now is a new one uh, with the provocative title Arts of Independence. Um, <laughs> the, um, the work that I've done on McDermott, um, in a way, indicates what I want to say about McCaig today. Um, because one of the crucial things that happened in McDermott's life, of course, was in the 1930s when he was living in Shetland. And he wrote this. I was better with the sounds of the sea than with the voices of men. And in desert and desolate places I found myself again. For the whole of the world came from these, and he who returns to the source can gauge the worth of the outcome and approve and perhaps reinforce or disapprove and perhaps change its course. It's that dichotomy of isolation and the independent solitary perception of the poet in that condition, as opposed to the position of the poet immersed in company in a social context dealing with other people, the voices of men and women, as we've, as we've seen them engaging uh, in the other papers that we've encountered, that we've, that we've listened to today, that I want to begin with before approaching the poems, the specific poems of McCaig, I won't talk about every single uh, poem that's on uh, the list, um, but I want to try and approach McCaig um, with keep, keeping these things in mind. How familiar is McCaig to you? H hands up if you've read McCaig before. <laughs> Overwhelmingly familiar. <laughs> so in a way, uh, the question is not to introduce him, but to reinterpret or replace or make him, make him fresh again, as if, he, as if he needs to be. Every time I read a McCaig poem, which is fairly frequently, it's fresh to me. I never have found him to grow stale. But it's a danger, it's a danger, it's an easily uh, imaginable danger that, um, that would worry me if I was teaching it so regularly um, as, as many people have to. So I was thinking about this when I was trying to put this together and trying to imagine um, McCaig as if for the first time. I have a friend who lives in New Zealand, and I sent the magnificent, you know, the most wonderful recent edition of the collected poems out to him. Gigantic book. McCaig is a miniaturist who only wrote wee poems, mostly, mostly. Come to another one, the, the longest one in a minute. But he said, my friend in New Zealand said he takes one of these poems every night, just one, just one, like having a wee dram, like having a wee nightcap. <laughs> and when his head hits the pillow, he's just there. He's, he's in the right place. The poems have that effect. The freshness of those poems can do this um, and, and renew perception. Um, it's, not the, it's not the poems that need to be refreshed. It's the perception of the poems that needs to be refreshed. The last time I saw McCaig, he told me that I must go up to Loch Inver to Ascent, uh, to his favourite place. And what he said was, every night when my head hits the pillow, that's where I am. That's my favourite place. That's, that's where you get to. So you have this sense of McCaig working as a teacher, as a, school te as a primary school teacher, and he used to say, I love children. I love children. I really love children. Up until three o'clock in the afternoon, after which I hate children. <laughs> I hate them all. Um, he didn't, of course. I mean, the, 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 I think one of the key things that comes through in various tributes that have been written about McCaig is that he talked to children and young people generally um, on an equal footing, independently, because the work of the imagination and that freshening that I mentioned a moment ago is something which children most often do, most easily, most quickly. And what McCaig's poems help us as adults uh, to do increasingly. There are, I mean, the familiarity that we have with McCaig makes it difficult to talk about him in some respects because he is most frequently known, most widely known, most loved, I guess, in, in many respects, as a poet, a, lo a great love poet, of the natural world, with wonderfully memorable poems about frogs, toads, birds, mountains, lochs, the basking shark, what have you. But I, again and again, the more I've read McCaig and the more deeply I've gone over the work, that's only, a, that's only one part of what his achievement is. His achievement is also in two major areas, two other areas. One, it's to do with language itself. It's to do with the provisional nature of language. It's to do with how language-making creatures such as human beings use language in a way which is 
precise, but also completely inadequate for what life is, for what living creatures are. And I think this gives him a terrific respect for the otherness of living things. I think that's the whole point about Basking Shark. It's very different from Ted Hughes, and, and it might be worth noting at the start that both Ted Hughes and Seamus Heaney um, praised McCaig hugely, supremely. Heaney saying, McCaig means poetry to me. Hughes, astonishingly, uh, writing in a tribute um, that... Uh, from the late 1950s, when I first met his poems in magazines, Norman McCaig's poetry has always been important for me. Looking around at the poetry written in these islands since then, from the 1950s onwards, um, it seems clear that he's been important for many, many others. So in order to um, approach him in this way, to freshen the perception of it, I wanted to go back and think about what we've heard today. James Robertson, when he was talking this morning about Scott Hogg and Stevenson, um, what, what was really emphatic uh, to my understanding of McCaig that came through from James's talk that connects the, the Scottish writers in this way is this connection between the tone of voice and the structure of verse the tone of voice and the structure of language that comes through in the, in the particularly in the prose and the novels of Scott and Hogg uh, and, and Stevenson, the way in which the Scots language and the English language and the representation of Gaelic in those novels has specific bearing on the way McCaig organises his poems. Career-wise, there's relatively little to say about McCaig structurally. He doesn't really... There, there are three stages. There are the very early poems included in two little books, of which this is one of them, a very rare item which I picked up for 80 pence. When I told McCaig I owned a copy, he immediately offered to buy it from me for £10 because he wanted to destroy it. <laughs> he completely disowned the poems that were first published in what was called the New Apocalypse Movement. And uh, you, can, you can tell why. Uh, this one... <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I don't mean that they're bad. Listen, this is the first verse of the, of the first poem in this book, Far Cry. The crying courage that has wolves running in it is the only courage that outlasts a wave falling, and hearts heedless after mining the hearts of other men crack before the cracking mast. Where can courage sound for me its appealing and gentle voice, who visit the dismal courts thumbed by a grimy king and snivelling courtiers whose voices echo emptiness, only the emptiness bred inside them by a destruction of... And a, I mean the sentence just goes on and on and on. It, it's absolutely the opposite of the kind of absolute clarity that you find in McCaig's poems, the poems that, that we most generally look at. But it, it's interesting to see that coordinate point, how he arrives at that. McCaig's... Um, Early poetry in these two books, which he disowned, uh, he, the, th the story is that he handed them over and uh, his friend gave them back and said, thanks, Norman, when are you going to give us the answers? <laughs> and he said it took him about a decade. His first published book was in 1955, I think, Riding Lights, with, that, with the sense of the meaning of that title. And it was as if he was saying, I'm going to write a very different kind of work now. It will be clear and simple. To go back to Dorothy's point about the, the relationship between difficulty and accessibility. McCaig wanted to be accessible, but he wanted to be accessible from the point of view of the most extreme situation you could imagine, the most isolated human perception, and the vulnerability and the, the, the inadequacy of language to express what, um, uh, what, what we really mean. So the structure of verse and the tone of voice is crucial in every one of the later poems when he starts to publish and retain the, 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 the publications that he's going to retain and use later. And basically, in the 50s and 60s, he writes poems which are rhymed and structured and patterned, have metrics and so on. Then in the 60s and 70s and onwards, uh, he uses increasingly almost always free verse. That's about all there is to say. The, the, the verse patterns in a poem like Basking Shark are unobtrusive. They're very delicately poised, very delicately pitched, but they're not heavy, they're not um, loaded with a uh, ballad meter or anything of that kind. They're all in a conversational tone. And, I, and just for the sake of it, I mean, I, I, I use this as a very old one. If you're, if you're familiar with it, um, forgive me if you're unfamiliar with it. I hope it helps. You know the word sift? You know what to do with the word sift? Yes? No? Is this? No? It's just that I, I, still, I still use it. I, mean, I still find it helpful for when I teach first-year students. Because um, many of them are scared of poems for whatever reason. They find poems is the most difficult thing to... You know, sift. S-I-F-T. 
Subject, imagery, form, tone. That's it. Subject, ask what the poem is about in the simplest possible way and answer it in your own words. Answer that question in your own words. What's the subject that's most about? Imagery, what are the pictures, obviously? Form, what is the structure? And you can say things about the, the, the structure of the poems of McCaig in this selection that contrast them with each other. Regular verse structures, rhyme schemes that are clear, but unobtrusive. When you read Basking Shark and see that shark, see, see the fins moving and then the tail fin following the, the, the major fin, the dorsal fin, it's, it's, like they're, it's like they're rhymes. The rhymes come and then follow each other, but they're always slipping away from you. There's nothing really, this, isn't a, this is a basking shark, you know, it's not Jaws. <laughs> and the point about it is, his perception of this creature with its matchbox brain is a perception of otherness. It's a perception of another living creature which has no language of its own. And every word that he can use to designate it, to describe it, to indicate it, and to indicate an affinity between himself as a living creature and this other living thing, is inadequate. It, 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 it can't be fully expressed, this thing. And that brings us to, I think it was Carl's reference to the sense of wonder that Adam Smith uh, wrote about in his book of the, about the history of astronomy. I'll come back to that in a moment, but I wanted to thread these things together a wee bit first. That emphasis in the first, um, and tone, the S-I-F-T, tone, tone of voice. Nobody writes more accessibly than McCaig. Nobody writes more fluently, and in a way that's a danger because that, the danger that Dorothy talked about in terms of accessibility, if it's not difficult, if it's not hard work, what's it worth? What he delivers is of immense value beyond this accessibility question. It seems to me that if you go back, if you think of um, James uh, Robertson talking this morning about the religious extremism and the psychological perversions that you find described and anatomized in James Hogg, the social psychology, the religious and moral distortions that are described in the Confessions of a Justified Sinner and in other of Hogg's works. These are distortions from what human beings can be at their best, at our best, what we can do. And what McCaig does time and time again is present and demonstrate what value is. He is one of the most unironic praise poets. When he talks about a collie dog going through a fence like a piece of black wind, there, uh, he's not being cynical, it's beautiful. In time after time, in, the whole, in this whole encyclopedia of metaphors and images, which is his collected poems, you have these, these two things happening. This very sharp, um, very sharp, acidic shock um, of perception. A hen stares at nothing, then picks it up. A sparrow rubs its beak, wipes its nose on a fence post, you know. Um, all of these perceptions are sharp. Then immediately, because he just laughed, you, you ha it happened. Immediately after that, or almost with it, is the warmth of recognition. The shock of perception, the warmth of recognition. That's how McCaig's poems, all, all of them, they all work that way. And you can see why he moved away from that early um, new apocalyptic uh, outpouring into the kind of poetry that he did write. That early stuff was very specifically intended to counter um, the so-called uh, um, socialist priorities of the Max Bondi group, McNeese and Auden and Cecil Day-Lewis. What McCaig and his contemporaries, Dylan Thomas particularly, uh, but other Scots as well, and Welsh writers, Celtic writers, I suppose, wanted was to invest their work with language and emotion and chaos rather than um, the uh, programmatic work of Auden and Spender and Delius. But that wasn't enough for him, for McCaig. He wanted to do something else, so he comes on to this, into this new, new, new way of saying. Um, it is uh, precisely what James said when he described, when he, when he quoted Italo Calvino talking about uh, Stevenson. And a very, it's a very interesting, I hadn't perceived that before, it's almost as if the criticisms of Stevenson are uh, foreshadowing the criticisms of McCaig. 
When Calvino says the combination here is a lightness of touch with a gravity of moral nucleus. And that applies absolutely to, uh, to McCaig. Don't underestimate the lightness of touch because the gravity of moral nucleus is there in McCaig just as much as, as it is in Stevenson. And then Carl talking about Ian Crichton Smith. Again, it seemed to me that this chimes with McCaig as well. Uh, McCaig was not a novelist or a short story writer at all, um, but the sense of identity that comes through in village life in Crichton Smith's short stories applies very particularly to McCaig's uh, experience of the Highlands and Islands and his sense of the community and his sense of the relationships between people that he encountered, that he knew as a boy, particularly from his mother who came from Scalpy. Through, um, through, even in its application in the city of Edinburgh, which is where he lived and, 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 and taught and worked, every summer he would go up to Loch Inver, to the, to the, to the, to the north of Scotland, far north of Scotland. Why on earth, he once asked me, would anybody in their right mind want to be in Edinburgh at the time of the festival? <laughs> Unthinkable. So he would go up there, and that's, you know, you, you'll have, you, you will have encountered the, the famous poems Toad and uh, the Loch Inver poems there. But it is that sense of, of a Highland world, uh, the Highlands of Ascent and Loch Inver, um, and the city of Edinburgh, that the two worlds that he inhabits in his poetry that are, um, that are, uh, that are very noticeable uh, in that respect, chime uh, with, Ian, with Ian Crichton Smith. Both, both of them, Crichton Smith from his Gaelic world, using English in the way that he does, McCaig always in English, always in accessible English, but with the Gaelic uh, intimacies and intimations coming through, uh, using that sense of the precision of language and the inadequacy of it for uh, representing feeling. And the sense of wonder, the sense that, uh, that Carl uh, quoted from Adam Smith's 1795 History of Astronomy, the emphasis upon the essential value of the sense of wonder. And what the word wonder means, which is to say awe and respect, that sense of otherness that he perceives in the basking shark, a sense of wonder at the scale of it with the matchbox brain, but also wonder meaning speculate. I wonder about that. I question it. I want to ask questions about it and leave those speculations open. Um, Ian, talking about uh, Tally's blood, the sense of community, and to what degree does anyone belong to a community? That's why I quoted the McDermott verse at the beginning. I was better with the sounds of the sea than the voices of men. The communities that are there in Tally's blood might be defined by language, Polish, Gaelic we talked about, by nationality, Italy, Scotland, Ian talked about, by loyalty in times of war particularly. And the connection, um, the connection there with McCaig, it seems to me, is really important biographically as well, because he was, as you know, a conscientious objector during the Second World War on the absolutely principled grounds that he would not kill another living thing. Uh, there are all sorts of ways in which that can be put into the context of Sorley MacLean or Hamish Henderson and ways in which you can approach McCaig in, in, a biographic, in biographical terms. But it's really important in terms of his choice of sympathy, to, to use that phrase, uh, Carl's phrase of, uh, with reference to Ian Crichton Smith. The choice of sympathy is an act, and, M and McCaig's choice, and it's represented in every one of these poems, uh, is to do with um, choosing sympathy for the living things. And language. He writes in English, as I've said, all the way through. Accessibility is paramount. But when asked in an interview, how Scottish are you? Because there was a, a serious moment uh, some time ago, it doesn't really pertain anymore, when some people did say things like, oh, he writes in English, he's not really a Scottish poet, not really a Scottish poet. And his, his answers to the question, how Scottish are you? 100%. <laughs> okay, well, and then finally, just to, to note, uh, well, we've mentioned it really, Dorothy's reference to the uh, question of accessibility and the value of the inexplicable. The inexplicable is always there in McCaig's poems. Sometimes it's a source for wonder. Sometimes it's a source for deep. Well, regret is too simple or shallow a word, really. Um, it's a source of grief. And you find this in some of the poems that are there in the list um, and some of the um, 
poems that you should have on the handout. If uh, I've made 180 copies, but I've, if, if you haven't got one, could you share one, please? Because I want to refer now to a few of these poems uh, in a bit more detail. Let's start. I want to start with um, a poem which is a poem of grief, but also of anger. And that's the poem called Aunt Julia. Very familiar, familiar poem, I'm sure, to everybody. But I want to connect it to, um, to the poem called Memorial, and then to go from there to the sounds, sounds of the day. Aunt Julia is a portrait poem, obvious enough. But what's, what strikes me as remarkable about it is that every time I read it, it's an angry poem that stays angry. I don't know if anybody has ever, in, this, in, this, in, in our company, in, our, in, in, in this company today, if any of, any of us, uh, any of you very generally have um, ever committed the sin of rhyme. <laughs> if anybody's ever, ever tried, to, ever done a beat. If you ever do, and you ever write an angry poem, it's the most difficult thing to write. Because whatever you're angry at when you write it, you might not be angry at the next day or the next week. And sometimes that emotion, the emotional intensity of it uh, fades. It does not fade in this poem. Um, and it's partly structure, it's partly tone, but it's incredibly artful arrangement. It begins as if it's a celebration. Aunt Julia spoke Gaelic very loud and very fast. I could not answer her. I could not understand her. The tone already is open engulfs, but the presentation of uh, the woman is festive, is celebra celebrative. She wore men's boots when she wore any. I can see her strong foot. I love that. I love the, I love the, the, the un again, totally unobtrusive representation of rhythm and the, convey the conveyance of meaning. Her, her strong foot paddling with the treadle of the spinning wheel while her right hand drew yarn marvellously out of the air. The assonance, the alliteration, all, all the very, very simple techniques just put to use in a, in a, a conversational style that has no uh, pretentiousness about it at all. And she's buckets and she's thruppany bits and she's black skirts and all of these wonderful things. And she, he's there as a wee boy in a box bed in absolute darkness, listening to crickets being friendly. It's very pleasing, very happy. It changes in the last verse, absolutely. She spoke Gaelic and he did not know any. He <coughs> had to learn it a little. And by the time he did and could speak to her, she is then lying in the absolute black, not of the friendly box bed listening to crickets, but of a sandy grave at Luskintyre. But I hear her still welcoming me with a seagull's voice across a hundred yards of peat scrapes and lazy beds and getting angry, getting angry with so many questions unanswered. It's a hugely political poem. People say McKay isn't a political poet. Forget it. My name, the word Riach, is a Gaelic word. I don't have any Gaelic. My father doesn't. He has no recollection of his father ever speaking Gaelic. This poem is about the loss of language. It's about anger and it's about grief. And it's also about the possibility of reclamation. The longest poem that he ever wrote, which is, a, I've given you the copy of the full thing there, slightly off the edge in terms of the photocopy, but you can read it later. A man in Ascent takes him to this Loch Inver area and he describes the whole geographical history of the place and the loss of people, of, language, of their language, from that area. What's interesting to me about it is that um, the crofters uh, who live there have bought back the land. McCaig's poem is its own historical moment, and its historical moment is absolutely Im crucial, it's, it's important. But the fact that it takes place in a history that can be changed politically, seems to me to be absolutely crucial. And what has happened in Nascent and Loch Inver, despite various qualifications that one could make, is an answer now, in the present, to the kind of grief, anger, tragic vision that you get in Aunt Julia and Two Thieves, the poem alongside it. Again, a, an angry poem that works by repetition and by, um, by a gr the growth of modulation of tone. If you look just very briefly at a couple of others, um, one of the ones I think that's on the, um, on the list 
is uh, Assisi and Sounds of the Day. Now, Sounds of the Day isn't on the handout, but, um, but I want to link it to a couple of uh, poems that are. Elegies. McCaig is one of the great elegists. If you listen to um, Beethoven's late quartets, uh, the intensity of sound and the intensity of meaning that Beethoven conveys with the minimal resources of a quartet, not a big orchestra, is, seems to me the equivalent of what McKay can do with the minimal resources of a very simple vocabulary, very um, uh, pared-down language that, uh, that he presents here. So Sounds of the Day begins in a happy world um, but ends with something else. When a clatter came, it was horses crossing the ford. When the air creaked, it was a lapwing seeing us off the premises of its private marsh. A snuffling puff ten yards from the boat was the tide blocking and unblocking a hole in a rock. When the black drums rolled, it was water falling sixty feet into itself. When the door scraped shut, it was the end of all the sounds there are. You left me beside the quietest fire in the world. I thought I was hurt in my pride only. Forgetting that, when you plunge your hand in freezing water, you feel a bangle of ice around your wrist before the whole hand goes numb. So you begin in a festive world, but he takes you into this world of isolation and agony uh, by the end of it. He does this through this use of language, which I think is absolutely uh, central to um, his whole achievement. If you look at the poem, it's on the handout called Limits, links to that. So far as we know, a dropped jar smashes without noticing it. Trample a flower, it dies with no malediction. Is the noise made by a star as it burns like a heretic in space a noise of agony? Three terrible things happened to me. I'm here, I survived them. I take this for granted, it's part of my knowledge. But what frightens me is, our knowledge goes so far as we know. Only so far as we know. And I think... When molecules jump from one figuration to another, they may not go hallelujahing into heaven or howling into hell, but water becomes ice. How does the metaphor... I mean, all, all poetry, all literature works by metaphor, you know? But very often the literal is the enemy. But here you've got a poet who's negotiating metaphor and literal reality to present you in the most accessible and simplest language, something that absolutely freshens your perception in that way. Now I don't want to take too long because we've got to have some questions and uh, open up to answers, uh, uh, questions from, the, from yourselves and to invite the other speakers who uh, you've been hearing throughout the day up here to, to, to respond to you. But I do want to just spend a, a, another couple of minutes maybe um, looking through two or, two or three other brief poems to try and uh, e effect this uh, renewal of perception. Stay on that page for a minute. Think of what we've just encountered in terms of the specific references to... There's a poem called Visiting Hour, which... Uh, you've read Visiting Hour, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, OK, well, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it. But look at the one called Memorial and think of it in terms of what I've just, what I've just read. Everywhere she dies, everywhere I go she dies. No sunrise, no city square, no lurking beautiful mountain but has her death in it. The silence of her dying sounds through the carousel of language. How do words help? Words always help. They do. Someone dies, you write a card or a letter or talk to someone. Sometimes, I mean, I've been in a situation once, remember, where a friend, uh, his, his wife died very, very young. I was literally speechless. I didn't know what to say. But words help. They help. They always help. The carousel of language. It's a web on which laughter stitches itself. How can my hand clasp on others when between them is that thick death, that intolerable distance? She grieves for my grief. Dying, she tells me, that bird dives from the sun, that fish leaps into it. No crocus is carved more gently than the way her dying shapes my mind. But I hear, too, the other words, black words that make the sound of soundlessness that name the nowhere she is continuously going into. Ever since she died, she can't stop dying. She makes me her elegy. I'm a walking masterpiece, a true fiction of the ugliness of death. I'm her sad music. Again, they can just... It, was all, it always seemed to me a terrible 
mistake that the 18th century put a happy ending on King Lear, you know? These, these are poems that do not have happy endings. They are about grief and tragedy and irre irrecoverable loss. They are without consolation. It's a poem called No Consolation. But let me offer finally uh, what I've been trying to do while I've been looking at one or two of the poems that are on the, the, the text list. What I've been trying to do really quite self-consciously is to give you this handout so that there are lots of other poems that you can refer them to. The one thing that I, I find deadening, really mortmain, the dead hand, um, is endless analysis of a single poem, phrase by phrase, line by line, letter by letter, um, until you get to the point where I just don't want to read it again. You know, it's, it's been killed. Um, it's wonderful to read a poem and analyse it very closely. It's fantastic, but it should be pleasure. Uh, William Carlos Williams, the great American poet, if it ain't a pleasure, it ain't a poem. <laughs> so let me turn it around just to finish with. If, you, if, this, if the poems that are on the set text list link to these aspects of what McCaig does, and I'm making a really big claim for McCaig, I'm telling you he's one of the major poets of the 20th century. I'm telling you, he's a greater poet than, but we don't have to compete. <laughs> but I tell you, if there, was a, if, there was, if there was the proverbial desert island, it would be this collected poems that I'd want with me, and not some of the more famous ones. No harm to them. Important, though, to get that sense of value, that sense of confidence. Okay, turn it around just to, just to, um, to close in on. His sense of humour. Hogmanay. Murdo gave the cock meal damped with whiskey. It stood on tiptoe, crowed eight times and fell flat on its beak. <laughs> Later, Murdo, after the fifth verse of the Isle of Mull, fell glass in hand flat on his back, doing in six hours what the cock had done in two minutes. <laughs> I was there, and now I see the cock crowing with Murdo's face and Murdo's wings flapping as down he went. It was a long way home. <laughs> Or I love the one called the In a Snug Room. I won't read it out, but just read that one and think of Fred Goodwin, right? <laughs> Between mountain and sea, honey and salt, land smell and sea smell, as in the long ago, as in forever. I love that tone. I love that sense of, uh, you know, we've heard it all before, as in the long ago, as in forever. And yet, it's absolutely present right here, that smell of the sea, that smell of of the heather, of the land, or whatever it is, to the sky, call, Tyree, Loch Inver, something up that, that, that those worlds return to you, if you let them. The days pick me up and carry me off, half child, half prisoner, on their journey that I'll share for a while. They wound and they bless me with strange gifts. The salt of absence, the honey of memory. And that's another wee thing that I've, I'm, I'm actually going to do this, uh, this year. I haven't done it for a while with my students. I'm going to ask them to memorise a poem. And <laughs> we're gonna have a, we'll have a wee test this week. <laughs> By this time next week, memorise. It doesn't have to be a big poem. I'm not asking for Paradise Lost here. <laughs> but a wee poem like that, as soon as it's in there, you've given them something actually that, that a person can keep forever, you know. Last one, um, the one I, on the last page there called Five Minutes at the Window. And again, this tone of voice. <coughs> We've been to the Highlands, we're in the city now. It's on the last page of the, of the handout. A boy in loops and straights skateboards down the street. In number 20, a tree with lights for flowers says, It's Christmas. The pear tree across the road shivers in a maidenly breeze. I know Blackford Pond will be a candelabra of light. A seagull tries over and over again to pick up something on the road. Oh, the mother. <laughs> and nobody else would write a line like that. <laughs> Only Norman McCaig would write a line, Oh, the motor cars. <laughs> Who do these people think they are? driving up and down on roads <laughs> in motor cars. Where do they think they're going? And what for? What is so urgent and important that you can't just look at the window for five minutes and see these things? And a white cat sits halfway up a tree. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but this is the point, and it's like, I mean, 
very familiar, you know, a poem like Toad is very familiar, and the, you put the jewel in the skull and the jewel in the dark, the, the radiance is in the darkness, the dark place of his own mind. Again and again you get this in a, in a fresh and a sharp way, if you, if, you, if you let it. The whole point of this poem, five minutes at a window, trivia, is to remind us of the virtues of peace. Why we are here, what we can do with ourselves when we're not having to rush around in motor cars. Trivia. What are trivia? They've blown away my black mood. I smile at the glass of freesias on the table. My shelves of books say nothing, but I know what they mean. Isn't that great? I'm back in the world again, and I'm happy, in spite of its disasters, its horrors, its griefs. We've encountered these griefs and horrors and disasters in Gaelic, the la loss of the language, the landscape of the highlands that can be reclaimed, has been reclaimed in some places. The horrors of war that he refers to elsewhere, the, 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 the frustrations and inadequacies of language to deal with otherness and the respect that he gives to other things, other living things, its griefs, personal griefs, the loss of loved ones. But these things are important. They stay with us. He gives you that as well. I'm going to stop now and invite... Um, Thank <laughs> you.